Good afternoon from Austin, Texas. On behalf of the NMC, I'm delighted to welcome you to the NMC Beyond the Horizon. In this one-hour discussion, we'll explore a key theme found across multiple editions of the NMC Horizon Report series. Increasingly, portable devices, including smartphones, tablets, and wearables, are capturing a larger share of the information market. With the shift to mobile content consumption, uh, and most recently production, uh, educators and learners expect access to educational resources anytime and anywhere. Today, our moderator and presenters will focus on mobile's impact on digital strategy, user experience, virtual reality, and location intelligence. I'm your host today, Alex Freeman, Senior Director of Membership and Special Projects at the NMC. I'm joined by NMC's Gordon Jackson. He's the, he's the uh, NMC logo in our little film strip. If you are on Twitter, uh, we are too. Our hashtag for today's event is hashtag NMCHZ. That's NMCHZ, and that's uh, where you'll find all news uh, related to uh, all things Horizon. So um, even beyond this program, um, check that hashtag out uh, where, we, where we talk actively about our publications. Uh, now on to the moderator of today's program. It's Brendan Chaco from QZM. He is joined by NMC members from uh, Miram Learning, North Carolina State University, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and uh, Visitor uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, take it away, Brendan. Hey, everybody. So nice to be with you today, Alex, uh, New Media Consortium. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Brendan Sieco. I'm the founder and CEO of QZAM, based in Boston, Massachusetts. We help museums and cultural institutions engage their visitors using digital. Um, I started designing and developing technology at the ripe age of 11, started my first company at 13, and was working with Fortune 500s, major entertainment brands like Mick Jagger and Katy Perry before I could legally drink. Um, I started uh, kind of later in my, my teenage years becoming more and more passionate and excited about arts and culture and museums and had the opportunity to work with museums and quickly saw kind of this desire, this need, this want for deepening learning and engagement through digital and that's what prompted me to, uh, to start QZM. Um, Really excited to be here. We have an exciting group of panelists, and uh, this discussion has been something I'm sure we're all powered and fired up about. Um, I want to introduce our next panelist. Uh, we have uh, Kathy Dunnigan, lead uh, instructional designer at North Carolina State University. Kathy, tell us, tell us a bit about who you are and what you're working on. Hey, thanks, Brendan. Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Currently, I'm the lead instructional designer at NC State University. I work with a group called Distance Education and Learning Technology Applications, DELTA for short. And my internal team is called Instructional Innovation Services. And that team gets to work with faculty. And um, we're, so we're instructional designers and project coordinators and multimedia specialists working together with the faculty to create um, innovative solutions to instructional challenges. So that's my day-to-day -day job. And the, my focus right now is on 360-degree video virtual reality. It's a, a new field that we've gotten into. The price point on virtual reality technology has come down in price, so the education can actually get involved with it, too. We started about, yay, we started about three years ago on a project. Um, we didn't even know what virtual, uh, the 360 video was. We were just starting out on an e-fire prescribed burn class, so we had to create a field trip for distance education students in an online environment. We wanted to give them the same experience as standing out in the field with an instructor. So what we did was we printed, we used our makerspace here at NC State and printed a rig that would hold six um, GoPro Hero cameras, and that shoots in all directions. And so then um, we shot that video on site, burning in the pine plantations of <laughs> North Carolina sand hills. Um, and when we came back and stitched that together, the idea was this was a video. You can look in any direction, up, down, left, right, behind you, and down. Um, and we were going to do that on a computer screen. And about three months after we had that ready to go, Google Cardboard came on the scene. If you haven't seen it, it's like a stereoscope. And it allows you to, the viewer, to, to really be immersed in the video and look in directions, all directions. Um, it was fascinating. We were, we were uh, pleased beyond our expectations. And now we've applied that um, across many courses and many disciplines from um, 
from this eFire field trip to um, a training um, um, tour inside us uh, for safety inspectors inside our Howling Cow dairy plant. Um, and it, it goes further and further. We're using it with College of Design students to put their designs in real environments out in the real world so that people can see their work virtually as if it were really there. So, awesome. As you can tell, I'm excited. <laughs> awesome. We're excited to have you, Kathy. Um, next up to that, we have Chad Cover, Chief Content Officer for SF MoMA. Uh, Chad, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and the awesome SF MoMA uh, mobile project. Hi, everyone. My name is Chad Kerver. Yeah, I've been here since the age of analog, many, many years at SFMOMA, and I've gradually moved increasingly into the digital space. And uh, we uh, have been closed up until a month ago or two months ago uh, for a two and a half year renovation and expansion. And it gave us the opportunity to rethink our audio experience in the galleries from the ground up. And from the very beginning, our concern, almost in the, in, in the exact opposite to what Kathy was just discussing, was a head up, eyes on the actual artwork experience that we would then augment with something inspired by Radio Lab and the recent renaissance of podcasts, a kind of very diverse, very quirky, very expansive notion of expertise in the art museum. Uh, that uh, moved steadily away from the traditional curator voice. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not involved heavily, but uh, it's in dialogue. They're put into dialogue with multiple forms of expertise uh, so that we were providing as many ways into the artwork as possible. Um, and as it happens, Apple Location Services finally reached a degree of functionality that uh, allowed us to do very specific location-sensitive uh, work, and so we have both uh, what we call a la carte uh, audio experiences which you can discover as you're walking from gallery to gallery as well as audio guided narrative experiences ranging from 20 to 40 minutes um, and we are pleased to see we just got some stats back that the top five tracks uh, in our new app are all extensive guided audio walks um, and people are staying with it a surprisingly long time so so we're excited about uh, both I think the eight to ten tours we already have and a continued kind of rollout of diverse voices from the Bay Area and beyond um, and even striving for that magical maybe even tour releases can become destination experiences in themselves in addition to the schedule of the museum so that's where we are and I can answer further questions later Excellent. Thank you, Chad. Um, next up, we have Jim Hahn, Orientation Services and Environments Librarian at the University of Illinois. Jim, tell us, tell us a little bit about some of the cool things you're working on. Sure. Uh, thanks. I, I work with first-year students primarily, and really what uh, my job entails is designing and developing uh, prototype technologies to help students uh, find library resources and incorporate them into their work. Um, Increasingly, that's come, you know, to encompass uh, the investments that we make in digital content. And um, with the Minerva app uh, for libraries, um, really what we've done is just kind of continually iterated different modules uh, by way of user studies where we vet ideas with students. And then we upgrade various app functions based on student input. And one of the um, most requested things we got to develop was um, uh, in library wayfinding, and the technology wasn't really there yet until these Estimote, uh, Estimote beacons came out uh, from from the, the startup uh, company, and they these kind of take take a you know indoor positioning to a new level. Um, really, what we can do is within within the library, uh, we can show students relevant items that are relevant digital items related to where they're standing next to print resources. So um, that type of uh, you know location awareness and location-based service, it really hasn't been possible before now. But um, it's a it's a great tool for first-year students as they they're navigating the print stacks and we're really starting to incorporate all that digital content. That there kind of is definitely a growth area um, for libraries now. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Jim. Um, and I'm sure the audience is going to have a lot of questions about your experience with beacons and location. Um, Last but not least, we have Lorenzo Vallone, uh, SVP and Chief Technology Officer of Myram. Uh, Lorenzo, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, I'm Lorenzo Vallone uh, with Myram Agency. Uh, we are a digital, uh, global digital agency, about 2,500 people worldwide. 
and we're part of the J. Walter Thompson group, uh, which then rolls up to WPP. So um, our group in Miami um, specializes in mobile app development and has for about the last five years. Uh, we've worked with commercial education and government across a wide range of different projects. Um, what, one of the areas that's been of particular interest to us in, in mobile has been um, really two things. One is the, the application of mobile to learning, to creating next generation course apps that are highly interactive, that are deliverable both online and offline, that are highly measurable. Um, and, uh, and we've been uh, doing some, some really great work with some, uh, some universities and other organizations, including DOD uh, organizations, um, to produce and create that content. And the other area is really the convergence of you know something that Kathy's obviously an expert in, which is the VR model and and bringing VR resources into uh, the learning environment, uh, and really uh, kind of taking the experience even beyond what mobile itself can do uh, into these highly immersive uh, and, and highly engaging experiences. So that's been uh, you know for about the last nine months or so, that's been you know a real passion project for us uh, and something we're really excited about. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Lorenzo. So let's let's jump into a uh, full gear. Uh, mobile is changing the way we learn, communicate, socialize, and see the world. I've even heard rumors kids are catching Pokemon with their phones. It's crazy. So looking back over the last couple of weeks and months, you know, Pokemon Go really uh, pushing forward the idea or the possibilities around AR, and then looking at the the movement, the energy around industry leaders now investing heavily into virtual reality. I'm very curious uh, to hear from you guys. What do you think about uh, AR versus VR? What do you think about you know the things that will become possible? And what's the timeline here? So let's. Um, I think Kathy, since you uh, were the first, you know, first to start and have been working on a, a virtual reality uh, project for the past couple of years, I'd love to hear your hear your thoughts. Sure. Um, thanks. One of the things that um, we faced here at NC State was a 360-degree spherical video. Not everyone considered that virtual reality, but when we put it in the Google Cardboard and we give it to students, that it becomes an immersive experience. And we've taken it a step farther now. Beyond just looking and observing the video, we are incorporating hotspots where we can add additional information. Students can engage with the video. It may um, be additional information. Uh, for instance, on the um, Howling Calderi safety inspection tour, we can actually build in um, instruction to have to record their observations and how that works, um, so that we can teach using this virtual reality experience. Um, and because it's real world, it gives them the, uh, the visualization of what the space is like before they ever have to walk into it. So another one is teaching. Um, nutrition students who are going to be teaching in community classrooms, give them the experience of actually teaching. And those videos are from a first person point of view. So all of that gives the immersive experience and so we call it virtual reality. It's a way for educators to use it and engage students. And we're seeing a great deal of success with it. And the price point is really, really low. Uh, Google Cardboard is less than 20 bucks. Um, the equipment has come down in price so that we can help faculty to produce it, and they can produce it themselves. So it's it's been a very rapid um, adoption rate. Like I said, we started just three years ago doing a different kind of video, and now um, everybody on campus is like, we want that in our course. Um, and so we found technologies such as the Rico Theta S that a faculty can, member can take. It just is two cameras they can hold in their hand or put on a tripod, go out in the field, and record themselves. Um, giving a lecture on site, so it's it's pretty exciting. Yeah, so we've we've definitely seen the barrier to entry and and uh, you know come yeah. down the price point, come down to the point where you know institutions of different shapes and sizes can now leverage these possibilities that five ten years ago just weren't possible or three years ago weren't possible. I'm very curious, and and maybe this goes to Lorenzo because you're kind of on the, the bleeding edge with, with this agency. What do you think the time frame for when virtual reality and or augmented reality will become a pillar uh, of a communication, a pillar of how we distribute information, just like social media has become? Uh, thanks, Brent. Um, it's, it's really hard to tell exactly, but uh, I certainly think it will be one of those scenarios where Whatever our predictions are right now, they'll, they'll actually be much faster. I think we're going to see a tremendous amount of acceleration from here uh, going forward. Um, in many ways, you know, Pokemon Go was the, the shot across the bow for, 
for everybody across the world, really. I mean, regardless of what industry you're in, all of a sudden we realize that 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 students, kids are playing with these devices that have the power to do, you know, what Pokemon Go can do. And if you can apply that to to learning, then it just really kind of transforms um, the the kinds of things that we can do. I, I agree with Kathy completely. The technology has advanced remarkably. I mean, I think we talked about this earlier that. I remember the first VR glimpses from about 20 years ago in film, and it you know felt like a pixelated Minecraft video. I mean, it was just uh, just just kind of a not a pleasant experience. And today, uh, what's happening with VR, with the solutions that are being created with gaming, with with filming um, in VR, even the Olympics were just were just uh, uh, released entirely in VR, which is which is incredible. Um, so I think the combination of the technology, the interest uh, from people in general. And the experience that people have when they actually try VR for the first time, it's, uh, it, it's, it's just a remarkable experience. And I think those things are going to drive adoption uh, and innovation in the space. And, and clearly, again, there's a lot of investment in it um, that's just accelerating right now. So I think you know, we could be seeing, um, I, I know we'll be seeing changes in how we all sort of work, live, uh, learn, and play in, in the near future. You know, is, it, is it two years, are we two years away, are we five years away? That's a little hard to tell, but I definitely think it's in in the near scope of what uh, you know of our near future. So. Totally, and I remember last time we were all talking, uh, Lorenzo. I think you brought up Intel's investing heavily, and then we we all cited um, Magic Leap, which I think has raised uh, 560 million dollars to bring you know new level of uh, you know new, le new level of immersion uh, to the field. So it seems like everybody. Every industry titan is moving forward in this space, and it's just coming very, very quickly. So, on a kind of on a flip side, you know, we see the 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 wants, the needs, the desires of of art museums being a little bit different than other spaces. And I think Chad, um, the work that you're doing at SF MoMA really limits the amount of interference from a device, you know, between my eyes and the works of art in the collection. And you've opted for a more Heads up experience. There, there's no head mounted display. My head is up. My eyes are fully directed towards the things that I'm experiencing. I'd love to, you know, learn uh, a little bit more about, you know, the process of how you built the experience, how you started to think about the content, and why you think that that was the right, you know, direction to go with the SF MoMA crowd. Yeah, I mean, in fact, it was almost a retro choice aided by a new level of sophistication in the technology. And and for us, um, you know. It, it, even our website, we are not an institution that right now embraces the idea that a virtual experience of art is equal to that in person. You know, the idea that, that, that the museum is a social experience, that it's a contextual experience, and that we want folks in the building. From the very beginning, we decided that, that our mobile experience was going to be a building-only accessible experience and help drive that, uh, drive that attendance and drive that first-person experience with the art. So as we were canvassing the field and looking at the many great advances that our peers were making, and I think really at the point we were first looking, um, Cleveland was a fantastic example of an institution that had vaulted itself forward uh, massively in its digital menu of possibilities. Um, you know, one of the things we noticed was that too often the AR model forced you to look at the artwork through the screen itself. And of course that's, you know, <laughs> quite a lovely paradox actually to force your visitor to uh, to mediate to mediate a 3D physical artwork with with a device, and so um, so very early we established the idea that that we should be making this technology as invisible uh, as possible, um, and even flirted with the idea of, of of wall labels that we'd be using digital ink that would only appear if you somehow interacted with them. So we looked at a lot of options and just realized, like, boy. Um, you know, sound is here for a reason, um, and um, and the immersive capabilities of binaural sound and the quality of the sound production that we could engage with really, um, really allowed us to push to a place where museums had not been before. And um, and the amount of feedback we're getting right now, we're getting both lovely numerical feedback, but also just f folks that have said, "I've just never had this kind of." experience of, uh, of uh, it's like having a, like a thousand friends inside my head with me as I travel through the museum and the sound is even designed to come at you uh, from the left as if a friend is walking with you through the gallery so and then finally you add sync so that folks can listen together and hopefully still have a social experience so these were really the animating um, ideas of why we went where we went and it just so happens that there was a company here in San Francisco called Detour founded by Andrew Mason formerly of Groupon 
that was doing outside what we had hoped to do inside, and so we worked together to create a new indoor iteration of their app. Um, you know, as I think probably everybody here knows, it's much harder to locate a human being in a 20 by 20 room than it is to locate them from a satellite in space outside. And so it proved to be unbelievably challenging mm -hmm. uh, to, to finally get that right. So. Yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about location intelligence because that's making a lot more things possible today. One could say your, your smartphone was actually a dumb phone and it's just recently became smarter because of the context, the understanding of where it is what's around it with all of these you know, sensors and radios and external sensors being able to grant those possibilities. Uh, Jim, let's talk a little about, bit about the work that you guys are doing with iBeacons to create kind of a friction-free experience and, and one that uh, is more contextual. Um, let's learn about it. Sure. Um, so in order to get this off the ground, it started with a pretty s small grant, pretty modest. I think we had about three, three and a half thousand dollars to uh, purchase beacons and we got about 52 beacons that covered our, uh, we were able to place them in the ceiling tiles so the students can't even see them so they're, they're invisible to the students really and so there we set up a grid system and uh, there's a little bit of math behind this but it's not a uh, hugely complicated math it's similar to triangulation it's trilateration yeah. and really you just have you just with um, you do that um, not with circles, but with like angles, or really not with angles, but with uh, the distance to the center of a circle, which is a little more a little more basic and not as difficult. Um, and once we had enough saturation um, and that and the math library, we were able to uh, incorporate this into both iOS and Android. And while there are SDKs available from Estimo, you can also just use some you know, basic math um, based on where where you're seeing the signal and two other signals. Um, and then we spent this summer troubleshooting and uh, eliminating some of the bugs from it. We're getting ready to launch an iOS update. And uh, so we've had it into the Apple Store and we're sort of revising uh, based on some feedback, but we're going to have it available shortly. I think uh, some of the key things that uh, sort of features we're able to provide are sort of uh, giving them this uh, sort of contextual experience of in the building of what they expect to see online. So we could do things like show them what are the popularly circulating books based on where they're standing. And so that really mimics the algorithms that people are used to seeing online, which are show me the things that other people are looking at, show me the things that other people viewed um, after, or what they bought after viewing this. And we can do that in the on-site experience. We could say, these books are popularly circulating. This is related uh, based on shelf classification um, libraries. Or, um, they're not really based around the object like museums, mm -hmm. but um, they do have this uh, um, other feature of co-location where similar things are, are next to each other and, and that co-location is derived from uh, subject metadata. So we're able to, to leverage that, that great um, human-drive metadata that librarians put into it over, over many, many decades, actually. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we're, we want to do more user tests and, and see what other features uh, or what else we could take away to kind of um, get them straight to the materials that, that uh, they're interested in and really just support them in finding the, the, the digital content that we've been investing in. Well, it's great to hear you've kind of taken a deep dive into how beacons work and responding to the kind of reactions of your visitor and doing intensive visitor tests. I, I also am fascinated with the, with the, I guess, the notion that you guys are using recommendation engines to kind of analyze the behavior, analyze the interest, and to be able to uh, serve content related on them. That's like the true form of context that I think there's a lot of potential in. One of the things that I've heard most of the panelists bring up is, is this idea of um, the invisible interface. And, it's, and it has been said the best interface is one that is no interface. So something that is reacting to your physical behavior, whether it be in the physical world or digital world. Um, so I'd love to just open that concept up to the panelists to kind of talk amongst uh, yourselves what you think have, have been great examples of that, where you think things are moving um, kind of around user experience design for the visitor, whether it be on-site or off-site. I'm looking at you, Lorenzo. <laughs> You're looking at me, brother. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you know, the, the interesting thing about about mobile in general has, and, and this has been one of the um, challenges, I think, is the fact that 
you really have two options with mobile. You can, at least today, and there's changes in, that are happening now, but you can download an app. So you've made an express decision to download an app to do something, um, or you can leverage the mobile web. And, and obviously both have pros and cons, um, but the, you know, the, 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 one of the powerful things about having that app, once it's loaded on the device, obviously, is that you have a lot less friction from, you know, you, you rely a lot less on the bandwidth around you. You can leverage um, the device's capabilities. So it's almost like we've taken the intelligence of this device and we can maximize it. You know, what, what Jim is doing with Beacons uh, is a great example of that, right? That couldn't have happened without, without mobile devices that are capable of interfacing and talking to Beacons and the investments that, that Apple has made in that technology. That's sort of that, it's become like the seamless barrier that's, you just sort of walk through it and it recognizes who you are, potentially where you are, uh, what you're doing, and, and can really deliver a lot of value um, uh, in that space. You know, the, the, the other side, of course, the flip side is that the app has to be downloaded. Someone has to have an incentive, a reason to bring that app down. And I think, Brendan, you had brought up the, uh, I think we called it the, is it called the Apple Graveyard or something along those lines? Well, that, the App Graveyard, uh, yeah. The App Graveyard, right, which, is, which I, I actually looked at. I, I hadn't seen that until you brought it up, and I reviewed it. It's really dramatic how, you know, as, as we've added more apps to the App Store, the use of those apps has dropped, and the amount of time people spend with them has dropped. And this is something that I recall from a few years ago when we started really talking about um, where mobile was going and, and the opportunities and challenges. And one thing that always struck me was that, that mobile, because of the device size itself, um, will become a very valuable piece of real estate. You know, we can't have 10,000 apps loaded on, on a mobile device. It's just one, you just can't run them. And secondly, uh, people just won't, won't be able to use them or find them. So what we're probably finding more and more is that the number of apps that people actually have on their devices will shrink, um, but the value that they get from those apps will grow exponentially, particularly as we interface with external technologies with uh, the ability, for example, to do AR um, on a phone is, is just tremendously powerful now. And I think, you know, someone on the panel brought up the fact that apps can now be downloaded to your device automatically based on the context of what you need to do. So the app sort of just appears and then gets released or disappears later. That, that's an interesting idea. I'd be curious to see how, how that evolves. Yeah, so, so to the last... Can I jump in on that for, for just a sec? Yeah, Go. totally. totally. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to, um, you know, I would say the two things that, that we'll be looking at closely is, again, and that notion of the invisible interface, the, the forms of bodily control that are coming down the pike right now, and that allowing that device to totally stay in your pocket. You know, the, the, the watches have been, a, you know, a noble, though, flawed first try. Yep. And as we're seeing projections onto the skin and various kinds of bracelets and the like that a single touch or, or some kind of very simple embrace of would allow you to control your experience. I think that that's something that would continue to lend to that invisibility. Um, I would say the other thing that really interested us and and uh, yeah, <laughs> and Apple, uh, you know, in our discussions with both Apple and Google about trying to decide what we were going to do as a platform, you know, uh, you know, both are pushing as Lorenzo just said away from the app. But imagine a situation in which you're in a continuously mapped let's say Google mapping environment, you're going from outdoor to indoor, and you're allowed to tag audio content and video content mm -hmm. to that location. So regardless of whether you have the SFMOMA app, uh, that content can pop up if you say, oh, okay, I want to allow that filter, I want to allow that experience, you know, pretty much anywhere in the world. And, you know, so I kind of have this dream often, you know, we have loads of Ansel Adams pictures uh, at SFMOMA, many of them are of Yosemite, and the idea that you're walking through Yosemite, you do not have the SFMOMA app, and a little message comes up to you and says, hey, this picture was taken here in 1935, check it out. And so I think that, that you know, there are going to be some sort of massive scale opportunities um, once, the, once the tie to a rich content experience comes through basically the notification pane through yeah. native functionality of the phone, I think. Yeah, so part of, Chad, part of what you were describing is very much in line with this idea of what Google's uh, p kind of piloting right now and pushing forward called the physical web, where your phone's ability to interact with the physical world around it without needing uh, an, the native app downloaded to the, the device, but all the ability to ultimately access URLs and content. It's certainly coming, and, and I think the example you gave is really really quite interesting. And then kind of taking a couple steps back to what, um, Lorenzo, you were bringing up and I think is incredibly fascinating and it's going to change the landscape for mobile is this debate between do I go native? If I go native, here are all the reasons why I should, but then there's the barrier to download and then the cross-platform uh, issues that might arise. And then if I go uh, mobile web, 
I'm missing out on a ton of different uh, opportunities, but I'm keeping it simple, lightweight, um, and removing that barrier to download. What was announced in May at Google's uh, I.O. developer conference is this idea of instant apps. Um, and Lorenzo, you're kind of describing them as well as, as Chad. I walk up to a thing or a place. It might be the parking meter outside my building, and my phone knows that the intent that I have is to you know, pay the parking meter, so it just pops up this app allows me to pay. Um, and the same notion you know, applies to a museum. I enter the doors of the museum. I've made a conscious effort to come to the museum today. Why shouldn't the app automatically appear on my phone and provide me you know, instant consumer value? So like today, we live in this environment where we can all agree, you need to provide incredible consumer value um, in order to convince someone to download the app. And that's starting to change, and it's super, super exciting. Um, so I, I guess back to a lot of these things we're talking, to, talking about involve a certain uh, trust, uh, a certain amount of privacy exchange, especially when you're accessing location uh, information, sensor information, uh, as the technology becomes embedded in our in our you know, on our skin or a contact lens in our eye, a lot of privacy uh, trade-off will take place. I'm curious, um, what, are you, what are your guys' opinions on that? Where, where, you know, where do we cross the line? Where do we stay? Where do we go? I'll jump in with the education perspective because we're always looking at FERPA, you know, students' rights and their right to privacy and protection. Um, so when you start having automated apps and it's accessing your phone and your data and your information, everything about you, without that moment for you to say okay, then that's that's where I have to throw up a caution flag. You know, are are we ready for that? I think millennials are. I think uh, my nieces and nephews. Are. There is a lot of that going on, and and we're gladly exchanging privacy for convenience. But I think we still need to have that conversation, and it's certainly happening in education um, of what is the impact of this long term. Anybody else? I would add to that, uh, to Kathy's point, that it's been a challenge since digital, right, since we connected people on the Internet. How do we protect privacy? How do we protect, um, you know, people's identities and things like that? We're seeing, you know, we're seeing a tremendous amount of, um, of, of uh, very serious hacks and, and, um, and infiltrations of, of content, um, you know, some of which we don't even hear about. And, and, and the reality is that that's just going to continue to escalate. So we have to be really ready for that. I think we're going to kind of end up in a world where, um, you know, the, the studies show that millennials are definitely far more willing to provide personal information, um, preference information, in exchange for the convenience, as, as you said. Um, I think there will be some generational divides there in terms of how people respond to that. But in general, um, I think we're going to move more in the direction of if you want Google to operate for free, you have to give them something, right? And it's we've, we've sort of traded the cost for... Uh, giving up uh, a little bit of the privacy. And some people are comfortable with having a personalized ad appear in their email based on emails that they've written, uh, and other people are not, justifiably so. So, um, you know, in our world, in the agency world, we, you know, th there's a three-letter word that's, um, you know, is a very bad word, which is PII. You know, anytime we deal with personally identified information on an app we or, or on a website or anything like that, we really there's a lot of care that goes into how that content is handled, um, how um, the kinds of disclosures that we have to put in front of, of users in order to, to let them know that we're using this content. So I think there's a lot of attention paid to it, but I don't think we're going to go into a world where uh, somehow all of our privacy is, mag you know, all of our, you know, secure data is magically um, protected. Um, and I think certainly there's going to be a lot more instances of, of data being, you know, used in ways that people don't like or don't expect. I mean, it's absolutely true. I mean, if you think about what we are doing right now, using Google Hangout as a platform. I think we can all agree the, the benefit to everyone who is involved right now is this convenience, this clarity, the access to the content. We've made great value, and because of that, or hopefully we've created great value, but because of that, people have gone, okay, we're using a Google thing. Maybe I know, maybe I don't know, but Google does access certain bits of information. There, um, they do have a data use policy and so on. But yeah, it's this, it's this constant um, thing that I think over time is just getting more and more lax, relaxed. We're granting access to all bits of information. If we're if you're using Google or using Facebook or using any major platform, chances are you've granted them 
a significant amount of, of access. You've granted them privacy. And I think amongst millennials especially, I, I think people just tap, you know, grant permission or allow without thinking twice now. It's just kind of the expectation to be able to uh, have the experience you're looking to have. Right. It's, uh, back, to, back to that mantra we were yeah. talking about last time, right? It's only creepy if the value proposition sucks. Right? If it sucks, yeah. <laughs> And in education, Google's working with, uh, NC State is a, a Google campus, Google Apps for Education. Oh, great. So we have some added protections that Google acknowledges and recognizes about student data. And because of that, then we're able to engage and provide Google um, Apps f for all of our students, our faculty, and our staff, which makes it very, very convenient, but it also includes that protection. So that's why I like to see the conversation included um, as we go forward. Yeah, I'm really happy. I'm really happy you mentioned that. So I think that in itself, that companies like Google are seeing the importance, the education, the cultural community has to the overall sphere of business and and just being a global citizen. That they're willing and able to um, accommodate those data use uh, policies. So that's wonderful to hear. Uh, I'd love to hear from Jim on, on, the, on the question in the library, right? And academic freedom and who, who knows what I'm reading and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how, do you guys, how do you guys see that problem? Uh, recently at Illinois, I, I can speak for um, some of the, some things that have really caused us to look at all our library privacy policies have been um, this is particularly timely just because of the uh, learning analytics that's starting to ramp up a lot. And so we're looking at um, not just what data third parties like vendors are able to see, but um, from our own systems. And for this recommender, account-based recommender, I had to craft uh, a specific uh, library policy. And uh, I have a link to it, so we can get that out. But it's the policy statement basically is just, here's an awareness of what we're doing with your account data. And then it also um, it gives them a choice to opt out. So there's a consent mechanism. And actually, a, a personalized recommender, actually, we're approaching it from the idea where you not it won't be an opt out. Um, it'll be actually an opt in. So those are some considerations uh, you can uh, bake into it. But we also have um, you know, access and redress mechanisms whereby if people want to see what the data are that we're collecting, we say, what are the redress um, procedures you can go through, if, if there are any such available. Um, because we look at clusters of data, it's, it's actually simply not possible to give someone all, all the data that we have, because in order to do some of the machine learning, we de-identify and then look at clusters of things. And then finally, we have security statements, and we say where the data is, you know, uh, very generally, <laughs> how the data is secured. Um, so, so those are... Uh, and. Um, I could get some links out there about sort of like a template for this policy and then some specific policies I had to write um, just to do, um, you know, account-based personalized recommendations. And these, we're going to have to write more of these going forward, and uh, I, expect, uh, I expect a lot of libraries will have to reevaluate some of their policy statements that were kind of written uh, pre some of this, uh, you know, this era of uh, analytics and, and data, machine learning, this kind of stuff. Previously, it was uh, some of our data policies were really meant for even just sort of a, a pre-internet era, and they were really haven't been updated since that time. Interesting, interesting. So on the topic of content, because I, I realize we've talked a lot about the, the conventions, the machines, the devices, the technologies. I want to talk a little bit about the content and kind of the, the intersection of storytelling around that. And I think we, we, you know, we have a great... Uh, opportunity, uh, you know, to have Chad on on this uh, panel today, just given your role at SF MoMA and the fact that you didn't just have curators or artists talk about the works. You had the voices of of uh, people from Silicon Valley, the the HBO show. You had people from the local uh, sports teams. Uh, you kind of took a very atypical approach and a different energy to the content. Where, do you think other museums are going to follow suit? And, and you know, what, what are some of the, the you know, if you were to think about the magical moments that you're creating for people, what, how do you think through your process and what would your recommendation be to other institutions that are interested in mobile, interested in storytelling, interested in adding in a, a, a layer to the experience um, that, that involves content? I'd be very curious to hear your, your kind of approach there. <laughs> 
Well, ba based, based on my conversations with my peers and my own experience here at SFMOMA, I, you know, I don't think we could have pulled this off if I hadn't had a kind of continuous 15-year relationship with our curators and that our curators have been steady themselves too because honestly, before you even get to the technology or the storytelling strategy, um, you have to get to the to the trust moment with whoever is the god of the machine in your organization, and that can the be god the god of the machine. <laughs> you know, that can be the professors in the university, that can be the curators, that you know, it can be the you know the, the folks who own the brand uh, within a commercial organization, and really educating to th them through data on here is an audience that we will not be able to reach through the traditional method. And here is an ambassador or an evangelist or just somebody with a form of expertise that they will respond to. And then there's, there is a magic moment where you say, okay, um, you know, and not all people will find it magical, right? You know, like one of the things we confront in the museum is that artists are nuts, right? I mean, this is just kind of the standard assumption. So, so for us, um, we started to look around and thinking, well, who could we get to talk about this? Uh, and landed on the somewhat unconventional idea of the high wire walker Philippe Petit, who was famous for going across the World Trade Center 40 plus years ago, right? Here's a person who dedicates their lives to something completely ridiculous, you know, every single day. Um, and what can he bring to the conversation about why an artist would want to devote themselves to a particular problem or particular question for, in many cases, an entire lifetime? So. So for us, it's, it's a combination of kind of where is the, the tangential or the unexpected angle that opens it up to, a, uh, to a, a whole group of people who don't have any knowledge about art history, and then how can we make it universal? You know, how can, we, how can we raise a problem that everybody can identify with? Everyone can identify with the idea of banging your head against the wall against a really challenging problem, right? And so once you reset art making in that, uh, venue, then it's much easier to, to, to build something that is a bridge to a new population. I mean, you know, I'm very fond of saying it in the link that, um, that Alex was kind enough to put up because I couldn't paste it in the, <laughs> the thing. Um, you know, something like 0.2% of Americans are art history graduates, you know, less than 20% of college graduates have ever taken an art history course, and too often museums are speaking to them as if uh, they have master's degrees in their, you know, in their background. So, so treating your audience with intelligence, um, and then treating them with an intelligence that's not based in your own in your own disciplines, um, uh, mythologies is really kind of where we where we were trying where we were trying to go. You know, now now it's like I was joking with somebody. Our new mantra is, "What would NPR do?" And you know, whatever story NPR would do on an artwork that we have in the galleries is pretty much a Venn diagram. You know, lineup of circles between our audience, what our audience wants to hear, and and what we want to tell. So, uh, well, I like your approach on on this being very universal and speaking to people with with a level level of intelligence and respect and and kind of understanding. I think that's really really important today. And I'd be curious, you know. Uh, with these other projects, especially where virtual reality might not be telling a story or pro providing text-based or audible content where you're just showing the world. Um, what are some approaches to universal uh, kind of understanding uh, or universal access that you kind of have in the back of your mind when you approach these projects? So in education, we always start with a problem. So for our virtual re reality projects, we're starting with, like I said, um, a field trip experience. So we're jumping in and, and saying how can we solve for that problem or how do we give a classroom experience to someone before they step into a classroom. So that's the applied approach. Um, we're working with faculty and, and the creative thing that we had to do with one of our latest ones when we were out in the woods is that the entire crew who was on site to shoot this video had to hide behind trees so that we wouldn't be seen in that final 360 degree uh, spherical video by anyone. So, excellent. Thank you. And one topic we haven't um, discussed yet, um, but it's something that's been all over the news, uh, and, and especially amongst the tech community for the last couple of months, has been the idea of bots. The idea of messaging, uh, communications, dialogues between the the user, the visitor and something that's been trained to understand those questions and to reply to those questions. So, you know, mobile's a certain, mobile is certainly a big part of this, and you can look at maybe kind of the analog bot example could have been, I was talking to someone, I was talking to Max Anderson, and he gave an example of that, I think it was the Guggenheim, you could pick up a phone 
you can have a conversation with a docent who is at home in the you know at the convenience of their own home to answer a question. And then taking that flash forward to more recently, I think it was last year, you had Brooklyn uh, Brooklyn Museum doing a thing called Ask, which put power and comfort. Uh, in the hands of the visitor to ask whatever they wanted and that message would be sent to a real live person, a, a staff member of the museum to answer your question on demand or as close to on demand as possible. So it might be a couple minutes but now it's going to be instant because you'll have trained a system to know the answer and to reply. Where do you guys think where do you guys think, do you think there's a place uh, for, for edu do you think there's a place in the education space, in the museum space specifically, for these ideas, uh, or for things like bots? I'm actually working on a project now where we actually have, we're calling it creating artificial intelligence, but I'm taking Ooh, all right. of the, <laughs> the brain work from, <laughs> we take all the brain work of the faculty member, it's, um, it's a GIS course and they have to program in Python, that's the scripting language, and so we're creating this interactive tutorial system um, that lets them submit their scripts and they get the answer back that they would get from um, a TA, from the faculty, but we had to create this massive spreadsheet of all of this data, so if this line occurs in the code, this is the response, it's probably this, this is the feedback they should get. It's, it's amazing because the human being just does it really, really fast. But we wanted to create a system that the student can do it at 2 in the morning when they're working uh, rather than having to you know, call their TA and, or wait till the next day. So it's, it's been a fascinating experience and a realization of just how complicated what uh, you're suggesting is to do, to gather all that data into one place and then be able to feed it back on demand. Yeah. Well, it's so amazing I, to hear. I, I mean... I'm really impressed to hear that, that your university is working on those projects. That's really kind of uh, cutting edge, very much on the forefront. That's, that's awesome. I mean, it's probably similar these days to what's been happening in AR and VR and so many things where the, the cost or barriers to entry are diminishing and disappearing, where now you can leverage these third-party tools. You know, Mark Zuckerberg announced their kind of commitment and and future forecast about bots and opened up a toolkit that any developer um, or any fairly technical person could go and experiment with. So um, you know, there's a lot of promising things coming on that side, but it's really cool to hear that you guys are, are actually doing it. And uh, is, that in, is that something the students can use today or it's still in its kind of early pilot days? We are actually going live with it this fall, so piloting this fall. We've been working on it for about... Uh, Less than a year. Our, our grant, we have a grant program where we work with cool. faculty on innovative um, solutions for about a year. Uh, some of them are DE course grants, but some of them are this exploratory jumping in. That's how we got into this uh, 360 degree video. Um, so we get to, to try some really crazy things sometimes, and I love getting it into the Horizon Report because it, it gets the message out and says, hey, these are some, and we're just the spark, we're just the start. This is, we, we don't ever claim to be the experts and the final um, uh, voice to speak on any of these, but we are doing the exploration and we're doing it at a price point that um, we can do it at higher ed. It's a lot of fun. My job's a lot of fun. Very I agree. Cool. And Chad, do you think you know we'll come to expect some sort of bot-like interaction where you know traditionally serving the visitor the content, whether it be through the voice of you know. Uh, a high tightrope uh, walker or a football player might be and have someone be able to ask a question and have an instant response uh, from, you know, curator or someone from the museum's uh, voice. Yeah, you know, uh, I think the answer is yes. You have to do it better than a visitor would be able to do it by simply entering their question into Google. Google. And I think that that's, <laughs> that's actually the main. Is there is there sufficient predictability in the questions that visitors will have that you could actually build a system to, to respond to it with thousands of artworks on view and often some of the most um, um, surprising <laughs> questions that folks have into it? You know, I mean, the other challenge that we face, and, and you know, Kathy already, uh, you know, alluded to this, but I think it's even more severe in museums, is that, that, you know, the average amount of time somebody looks at an artwork is less than 10 seconds. So, so you know, if you can't answer that question very quickly, um, it's already dead. They're gone, you know, and so, so I think that the... I think that the um, the main issue for us is is getting that hook set fast enough to get them to pause 
And then maybe if they had a follow-up question or there was something that came with it, we, we were actually in dialogue. But Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, I, would, uh, I would just add maybe one comment to that, um, which kind of goes to the content question as well, and how do we make content even more engaging and dynamic, you know, to, to kind of keep people's attention and to, uh, and to really deliver value. And a lot of it has to do with kind of what we've seen. You know, when we get to the point where we can really um, effectively blend artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the ability to custom deliver content to an individual, I'm thinking kind of really in the learning space. And these are areas that we're, you know, experimenting with and, and, and other companies are as well. But really delivering a personalized learning experience to someone based on based on their preferences, based on their performance, uh, and then based on the availability of content um, and use a, a, an engine behind it, a bot, if you would, uh, to understand how that person is interacting and deliver new content um, in a way that, that is meaningful. I think that's where um, things get really interesting from a content perspective because the, you know, providing the same experience to everybody is already you know, really old school. Right? We've been personalizing content on the web, I think, as we get further ahead on mobile devices in particular, um, we'll be able to deliver custom experiences that are based on the, um, uh, not only on the user's um, uh, preferences, but their performance and then using um, intelligent engines behind that to, uh, to really um, customize that, uh, that experience. Yeah, there's so much kind of untapped potential around contextual delivery of content. You know, think about a person walking through a museum and as they approach slowly or quickly, their dwell time, their age, all of these bits of information. Um, if I'm spending lots of time in front of the Liechtenstein and the Warhols, uh, chances are I like pop art and you can serve me something in my language and my flavor. Um, so, yeah, I think we're going to start to see a lot more of that as the tools behind the scene, the, the, um, the machine learning mechanisms, looking to what, you know, uh, Google and Microsoft are doing to make those uh, elements much more approachable. And I think they're actually free if you want to tap into uh, Google's uh, artificial intelligence cloud or um, what was called Microsoft uh, Project Oxford. Uh, there's so much cool things you can do. So on, on the topic, you know, kind of looping back to VR and AR, um, just because of the, the growing interest in that. I mean, we've gone from software is eating the world to mobile is eating the world. Uh, these are all terms from uh, Andreessen Horowitz, kind of a, a technology futurist, uh, if you will. Um, I'm curious, do you guys think that AR and VR are going to be eating the world? Um, are these things that you're bullish on or bearish on? Super bullish. Doesn't, doesn't your business depend on that, Lorenzo? <laughs> <laughs> not, not really. I mean, our business really depends on sort of following what's happening. But, uh, but you know, that, that's really what we depend on. But I, I am personally super bullish on it. I think that, you know, we, we can create environments where we can – what Kathy's doing is amazing. Think about, you know, the low cost of entry to put somebody in a place – that they simply could not have experienced otherwise. Um, you know, I remember the first time I was at, at Unity Labs and I saw uh, I was in you know using the HTC Vive in their in their lab and and this blue whale uh, swam by me um, and it was just mesmerizing. You know, I thought, imagine students learning about you know the the, the whale's skeletal, skeletal system or you know its environment in an environment like this. This is so far beyond even what we're doing today with e-learning. That it, it's it's almost scary, you know. I was at, I'm actually in Chicago this week meeting with one of our agencies, and they've developed uh, an environment for retailers that actually puts the brand inside of the retail environment and lets them switch around products on shelves in real time and test it with live users all through a VR environment, so they can make decisions in light speed that that would have taken and taken weeks, months, and cost you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to do in, in traditional ways. So. I think that's the potential of where it's going to shift things. And I, I agree with Chad completely. The, the, rea the real reality I don't think will ever go away. I think, in fact, people are going to seek more real reality as we become more virtual. You know, they're going to look for, um, you know, I have this thought that someday malls will just disappear because we'll all shop from, from VR glasses. But the reality is teenagers don't go to the mall to shop. You know? They're there for other reasons. We, you know, we don't right. go to movie theaters to watch the movie. Same with the, the museum, too. It's a yeah, social it's experience. Same with the museum. That social interaction, I think, uh, that, that, that you know, personal contact is going to become, I think, even more important. And bringing that into the experience so that it's seamless, I think, will be a, uh, a key factor. But I'm, I'm super bullish. 
Does anyone else have any strong feelings for or against some of these, you know, some of these items? Do you feel that VR will take people away from the physicality, or, or do you agree with Lorenzo that this is something that, you know, is, it's coming, it's important, it's going to be, you know, an everyday part of how we experience, how we learn, um, but we'll still have, we'll still um, yearn for the human touch, the human interaction, and, and more than anything, the social interaction that takes place at museums and other institutions of learning. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Lorenzo there, too. I mean, I, I think, you know, right, what we're going to be able to achieve with VR, and I mean, Kathy's already, you know, Everybody Kathy's already thumbs there. up to these, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just the, you know, the ability to go inside a cave in Lascaux or to go inside, a, you know, an Egyptian pyramid, you know, those are experiences you can only have through VR, but, you know, and those complement, then, the physical experiences you can have in the world. So I think that, you know, it, you know the tool will, you know, the, the content will demand the tool, and there will be multiple strands moving simultaneously, I think. And that's exactly the approach we're taking with education, too, is that it's the combination. It is not the, 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 ex, the virtual field trip does not replace the actual field trip, but it prepares you for when you do have the opportunity to be out there, prepare you what to look for, give you an opportunity to learn before doing. So it's easy to say this might be one of the most exciting times and places to be in for anyone in the learning space, the museum space, the cultural space. There's so many tools at our disposal to uh, educate, to engage, to immerse visitors in the mission and the content. This has been an amazing conversation to have with, with all of you, and, and I hope that the, you know, our, our, our uh, people tuning in from, from their offices or their, their homes have, have felt the same way, and, and I hope we can take this conversation and continue it over social media um, and other avenues. So this has just been a, a joy to have this conversation, uh, this panel discussion with everybody today. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, thanks, Chad, Kathy, Jim, Lorenzo, Alex. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank, uh, awesome. thank you, guys. To wrap up today's program, I want to thank Brendan and panelists Chad, Kathy, Jim, and Lorenzo on behalf of the NMC for taking time to join today's discussion on how new, develop, new de developments in mobiles are impacting teaching and learning. Uh, viewers, if you want more information about anything you saw or heard today, let, let us know directly by contacting me at alex at nmc.org. That's alex at nmc.org. To learn more about future uh, NMC Beyond the Horizon programs and get involved in our community, please visit our website at nmc.org, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter at nmc.org. And with that, I want to uh, bid you all a good day and uh, and close out the. Uh, I guess this is the start of the school year, so uh, for for those of you prepping for for class, I hope that goes well. So, thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>